working actually um, originally as a graduate student researcher on antigen antibody binding studies um, using a number of analytical techniques and um, then uh, moved into various biosensor developments where she used uh, microfabrication to uh, develop um, electroenzymatic uh, sensors uh, for different uh, physiological targets. Uh, she then moved to Lawrence Livermore as a uh, postdoc, eventually became a principal investigator there and uh, um, eventually became the neurotechnologies lead. Uh, she was one of those people that was really instrumental in, uh, you know, supporting many of the NIH and DARPA efforts, uh, subnets, RAM, haptics, a lot of the brain initiatives, and really focused on uh, electrode material development for, um, you know, neural interfacing, both the stimulation and the recording side. And uh, yeah, then she became one of the co-founders and uh, the director for neural interfaces at Neuralink, um, a company that many of you may be aware of because it's associated with uh, a very prolific uh, serial and parallel entrepreneur, Elon Musk, who, um, yeah, a little more than three, almost four years ago, actually, probably by now, um, started going into that space as well with a, a significant investment until just about a year ago when she then decided to um, take off on, on her own and uh, explore new further opportunities. Um, again, uh, I've, I've gotten to know her through some of those efforts in, in the field. And um, I felt it was wonderful if we could get a little bit of her very busy time um, to just talk a little bit about the work that she's done and uh, hopefully in, inspire more of the students to, to cons consider that. Vanessa, thank you so much for making time. I hope that was long enough for our coffee and short <laughs> enough for Steve to not uh, make fun of me any longer. So with that, I'll stay quiet now and I'll pass over. I hope that, uh, um, wait a second, that uh, you can share your screen yeah. as well if you needed to. Okay. Got a growing number of people. All right, do you see a blank screen? It says Mavato, grad students right. and faculty, 40 okay. minutes. Yeah. Okay, great. And just the screen, right? Uh, yeah, I don't know where you are right now. In my view, let me see gallery view. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of people that don't show their faces. They're hiding for whatever reason. And, um, but yeah, right now I only see your okay. screen. Yeah. Great, all right. Oh, now I can see you as well. Okay. And the famous right. picture in the background. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, I call it my brain throw. Just around my head, brain halo. Um, thanks. Thank you again, uh, Florian, for inviting me here today. Um, you guys are really a powerhouse in neural engineering, so I'm honored to get to talk to you guys about my experiences in building implantable neural interfaces. And hopefully, I don't go over time. <laughs> So first I wanted to start with a quick comment on the career path that I've taken in case some of you are thinking about jobs and want to see what one path could look like. I'll also touch on the different stages of neurotech development going from R&D to a commercial product. Uh, then we'll get into these two topics of designing high channel count microfabricated polymer electrode arrays and some challenges in developing uh, packaging for these types of devices. So this is a snapshot of my career path so far. My PhD project was making biosensors for the brain and grad school is where I discovered and fell in love with the brain. So I was pretty disappointed when I finished and couldn't find companies that were actually making brain implants that I could use my background in. I only knew of the couple large DBS medtech devices at the time. And you know, I didn't think I wanted to do that. Um, but during my job search, I discovered research institutions and government labs, and I ended up joining a small unknown neurotech group at the time at Lawrence Livermore National Lab, which is here in the Bay Area, just outside of San Francisco. And that's where, as Florence said, I started as a postdoc and spent seven years 
help close to seven years helping them to develop um, polymer neural implants into a platform technology. That work uh, led me to help start Neuralink where I stayed for three years. And um, now I'm a consultant for several neurotech startups, uh, which is giving me a chance to figure out what I wanna do next. I think it's still early for me to do consultant. Like a lot of people think of that as their retirement job, but <laughs> it's a nice way to look at different technologies all at once. So uh, my point here is really just to remind the grad students and the group um, that you have many options like research institutes and government labs, but you could also work at the FDA or for a nonprofit or in government or even as an associate uh, for a BC firm I'm, as I'm learning. And I can't speak for those other options, but uh, if you have questions about working at a government lab or a startup, and I'm happy to talk about that during the Q&A at the end. So today we were talking about building neural interfaces, okay? And my introduction to neural prosthesis, as mentioned, was at Livermore. Our expertise was in hardware components of implantable neural interfaces, specifically the thin film flexible probes, microelectronics integration, and, um, and packaging and electrode material development and testing. Through my roles at Livermore and Neuralink, I've been able to work on technologies to advance basic science and also on devices that were designed for human implants to advance therapies. And over the last few years, um, really, I, I've gotten more interested in taking these cutting edge devices that, were, that we were making in research and trying um, to get them out into the real world and to patients who really need them. And what I've learned in working in this in between space, uh, going from R&D to clinic, is that there's a huge gap between the two. Huge gap between all of the exciting tech that we're reading about, that we're publishing on versus what patients actually have access to. And there's definitely been a lot of great progress um, in our field, but very few of these innovations make it to the clinic, much less to a commercial product. And this really bothers me. So I think neural engineering, a lot of us are working on promising tech but what I'd like to see is less promise and more delivery. So let's talk about why it's so hard to go from promise to reality. So the, this slide's kind of busy, apologize for that, but hopefully I can explain the gist of it. Um, it describes the progression of a technology to get to a commercial product. So going from left to right on, on the screen. The, this idea of a technology readiness level is meant to be used as a, a way to quickly assess what stage a technology is in the development process, it originally devised for rockets for um, the space industry. So the higher the number, the more ready the device is for launch or commercialization. This, is, this can be broken down into three major sections. So the early stages on the left-hand side are where basic science research and concept development happens and is typically performed in academia. So a lot of people uh, on their PhD projects fall in this category. On the other end, on the far right-hand side is where you are focused more on business development types of activities and things that it takes to get a product into market like large-scale clinical trials to test the, the efficacy of your product. This work is typically done in industry setting at companies making um, devices for profit. Now in between is the technology development. And this is where you take those great ideas that you had in grad school and you try to validate them, scale them up, start to show that this technology could possibly turn into a product. And uh, this is also where you start to do preclinical or animal testing under regulatory standards and you start to do your first clinical trials. So when I say that we are struggling with this transition um, or, or gap from R&D to clinic and commercialization, I'm really talking about these middle steps. And a lot is happening in this gap. Uh, mainly, I think um, a big thing is a mindset change 
has to happen to succeed if you're trying to come out of that research and getting into this area. So now um, you, you have to start to think of things that you're not used to thinking about in research, like reliability of the device, integration into a full system, everything that goes with a clinical use, like safety and usability, how you're um, engineering the design of your product. And this, is, um, this gap is where many universities are starting to play in, which is great. Uh, this used to not be the case. This is also where most startups live. And unfortunately, this is also where most startups die because it's hard. It's really hard to get to that, that finish line of a product. To get there, there are many factors involved. So many things that have to go right. Um, just because you have a cool technology, it doesn't mean people are gonna to wanna to use it or that they even have access to it. Um, unlike a, a PhD project, you now have to figure out if you can find a manufacturer who'll make the device cheap enough so it's affordable, even if someone has health insurance, they might not be able to um, have access to it. Can you design the device well enough so it's intuitive for people to use? Can you test the device enough um, to convince yourself and regulatory bodies that it's safe? And uh, importantly, do you have enough money to pay for all of this work that can take many, many years before market approval? So you can start to see why it's so difficult to get over that, that thing I'm calling a gap. In terms of um, technical challenges, specifically in hardware, I think there are uh, some of the important ones that I think about that I think we need to overcome are, is if we want to see high channel count, thin film devices become clinical products, uh, which is the area I work in, is that we have, we have to figure out some of these things, which is miniaturizing hermetic connectors and packages, developing low power wireless electronics, and creating robust materials that can withstand the harsh environment of the body. And today I'll just cover a couple of these areas, which is designing the thin film electrode arrays and packaging components uh, that directly bond to the electrode arrays. I really actually don't have any expertise in low power wireless electronics. I couldn't talk about it even if I wanted to. Right. So uh, there has been a trend, steady trend, if you're following this field uh, in neural interface development of going toward smaller and higher ch channel count implants. One class of these devices is um, microfabricated thin film polymers. The microfabrication process allows for repeatable manufacturing of very small features, which allows us to move away from handmade devices with bulk materials, which is what most neuromodulation devices, uh, how they're made now. The polymer material is attractive because of its flexibility. What we're really aiming for is to design a neural interface that is essentially invisible to the brain so that uh, it doesn't, so that the brain or body doesn't reject it. This means we're trying to get the devices smaller, more flexible, make them look chemically more like the brain with coatings and uh, making sure that we're using biocompatible materials. So these are all different ways that different groups are trying to address this issue. And over the years, many researchers, including teams I've worked on, have been trying to validate this idea that microfabricated polymer probes could be an answer to getting us more data out of the brain, in and out of the brain, and uh, in a chronic um, implantable way. So here's a couple of examples of projects where we were pushing those limits both in channel count and showing that we could record neurons for very long um, times, at least in in uh, rat lifetimes. And this is work I did at Livermore with UCSF uh, and also at Neuralink. So at the time of publishing, as far as I know, these were the highest channel count polymer probe um, implants in, in rats. So how did we do this? How were we able to fit 1,000 and then 3,000 uh, electrodes in a rat's brain? So here I'm showing you some electrode designs that we made at Neuralink. And each of these, so if you see each of these threads, we call each of these a thread with a loop at the tip is a separate probe that gets inserted into the brain. And each thread is only a fraction of the width of human hair, which is what you want if you're getting a bunch of these implanted into your, into your brain. 
So the loop is where the robot, um, robot inserter that we developed at Neuralink um, can pick up the thread and precisely implant it into the brain. And the shiny dots are the individual electrodes. And remember for every electrode, uh, there's an individual wire that's attached to it. That's very difficult to see from, from here. So from left to right is the progression that we made. We were able to increase the number of electrodes per thread from eight to 128. Uh, but you can see that the width of the base of the probes uh, it didn't even double going um, to, to these larger sizes or channel counts. So how did we do that? How did we increase the number of electrodes by 16 times, uh, but without even doubling the width? So we did this mainly by two ways. One was we reduced the width of each of the electrod wires, uh, which also called traces. And we were, uh, in, in this manner, we were able to reliably go down to as small as about, uh, as about 400 nanometers per trace, which is thinner than some wavelengths of light. The second knob that we turned, uh, in, this, in the image this is about two microns wide. The second knob we turned was, um, we increased the number of metal and insulation layers. So these probes starting out with one layer is only about uh, four microns thick to begin with. So we have a lot of room in the Z direction um, to increase. So instead of having to put the metal traces side by side, making the probe wider, we uh, started stacking them on top of each other. So you can kind of see it in this image here. There's another layer of arrays or traces just underneath. So this isn't easy to do with polymers, um, but we got pretty good at it at Livermore and, and, uh, and then also at Neuralink. So here are illustrations of the cross-section of a microfabricated device. In orange, uh, if you look on the left, is the uh, metal layers, and in green represents a polyamide insulation. What makes this challenging um, with polymers is when there is topography or peaks and valleys and vias um, when you have those kinds of features, the coverage becomes non-uniform and it becomes difficult to start to resolve uh, very small features. It's not um, ideal like how we're always drawing these cross sections in microfab as shown here where everything is like a perfect rectangle coverage. Uh, really, it's, um, th there's a lot more topography involved, especially, especially with the polymers. So overall, um, more layers and Thinner traces are great ways to get you to smaller probes with higher channel counts, but there are limits. So for one, if you, if you keep making your metal trace thinner, at some point your trace resistance will become too high and also more likely to break, especially if you're making long devices that have to spend tens of centimeters because you want to get to deep regions of the human brain. Layering also has its limits. Um, outside of topography. So here in this graph, um, we're showing that the minimal probe cross-sectional area, so that's your probe width times your probe thickness, just shown in the y-axis, is a function of not just the number of trace metal layers, but also the electrode diameter. And if you look at the bottom left corner of the graph, at smaller electrode diameters, your trend is as you'd want. It's as if you, if you, if you stack up to four metal layers overall, you're going to get a smaller probe than one metal layer where you had to put the traces side by side. But as the electrode size gets bigger, so going to the right, um, the benefits of stacking diminish such that the optimal number of layers is actually one, not four. And this is true only in the kinds of designs that we were doing at the time where we were using vias to use um, to interconnect the layers. So with each layer, not having, having to take up space with these vias that I show here on the bottom left. And a lot of this work was done by my colleague at Livermore, uh, Angela Tucker. So here I've summarized um, the limits that I just talked about. Uh, the only thing I haven't mentioned is that as you increase more layers, you're also creating more insulation failure points. And that's because one well-known failure mode of polymer devices is delamination. So you can get ion ingress from these salty, wet environments of the body, 
And when that happens, you're eventually your metal traces and your electrodes will short and corrode and you lose functionality of your device. So I, I don't have time to go into this failure mode in detail, but it's a, an important note to make uh, anytime you're talking about challenges in high channel count polymer-based microfabricated probes. So to end on this topic, microfabricated thin film polymers are a promising technology for moving to smaller and higher channel count neural interfaces. There are many, many benefits to this process, um, but, they, but these types of devices are still not part of any large scale marketed commercial neural implant. And if you can help solve some of these issues that I've listed here, you could play a role, um, a key role in getting this technology into patients. Now let's talk about packaging, because it never gets any love, even though it's really important. So my goal is to provide more of an introduction to packaging as it relates to thin film, thin film arrays. And it's really a broad, broad field. Um, what I hope is to give you guys a sense of what some of the challenges are and what it's like to work on, on these problems if packaging is new to you. So first, let's get on the same page on components. And most of you are familiar with uh, standard commercial neuromodulation devices like DBS and uh, spinal cord stimulators. So as you know, they all have um, the same three basic components, the hermetic package that houses the electronics, the electrode arrays, and the cables that connect the two. Microfabricated neural implants have the same three components with a couple of key differences. The, uh, one, the electrodes and wires are very thin, as we've already covered, and much more fragile to, to handle. Uh, and two, there are many more electrodes, which means um, many more wires that you have to connect to the package. In this case, I'm, this is a 3000 channel example. Um, and this is one of the biggest challenge. How do you challenge, do you, how do you make those connections such that the electronics are still safely encased in a hermetic can and the package is still small enough to fit in the head. You can't use standard connectors in hermetic packaging. These are just way too big and they only serve like a dozen channels right now if you're lucky. Um, so we have to develop something new. One way is to directly bond the pads on the thin film to the stimulation and recording chip or the ASIC. So here I'm showing a standard wire bonding process. Uh, wire bonding uses ultrasonic energy to bond metal wires to metal contact pads on the ASIC and pads on the thin film. So if you look at the drawing on the left, um, pads are designed on the top of the ASIC and then are wire bonded down to the pads uh, that you've uh, designed on the thin film. So in most cases, um, at least that I've worked with, the thin film metal usually can't handle the bond energy um, and will delaminate during this process. So in this case, we electroplated nickel onto the pads to have more bulk to absorb that energy during wire bonding. And we got a much more reliable process. The problem is uh, this takes up too much space. So with wire bonding, um, it doubled the area that the chip alone had to take. So going from two millimeters squared to four millimeters squared when you add the bonds. And since um, for this particular project, we were aiming to eventually go up to 10,000 channels, we, we needed a different method. So another option is directly bonding the chip to the thin film pads using flip chip bonding. The drawing on the left, uh, the bonds to the thin film are made like a sandwich uh, un directly under the ASIC, like typically using solder. With this method, you can densely pack a chip right next to each other uh, in the place where wire bonds would have, take, have to take, the, take up the space. So um, that's what we actually put in action in, the, in this next version of our device. So here we had a 256 channel model and then we eventually got to 3000 channels using this method where we just really densely packed our chips. And that was what was used for that rat image uh, rat studies that I showed earlier. So this is okay for um, animal studies, but 
it doesn't work well for long-term implantable human devices. The main reason um, being that it's difficult to get a hermetic seal around the electronics. So this, what I'm showing here is um, the general process for flip chip bonding to thin film or, or one way to do it. So first, um, you know, if you're the engineer, think about you're the one doing this. Uh, you design the array and remember you're trying to get to higher channel counts while maintaining a small footprint. So key design parameters that you have to think about are the pad sizes and the, the pitch between these contacts. But as these parameters get smaller, you get to a point where conventional solder balls won't work. So this means now you have to figure out other bonding materials to, to use, which can be its own like whole research project in itself. But you figure it out. So next, you flip chip bond the chip onto the thin film. And for that step, so we're looking at the second step here, some of the knobs um, you can turn are the heating temperatures of the chip, temperatures of your substrate, the force that you're applying to, um, to make the bond and the time that you are holding at each of these steps. So this step also can be its own project to develop, uh, especially if you are now using non-standard bonding materials and substrates, which you will be if you're pushing design limits with higher channel counts. You know, you can't, anytime you're working on the edge of technology, you can't just send these out to vendors anymore. You really, almost every step is a PhD project here, uh, which actually every step, yeah, can be a PhD project. I think I've interviewed people who, in each of these areas um, uh, that, that were getting their degrees. So you eventually figure out the bonding process, and now you have to insulate the bonds. So that's step three. And as I said, like the other steps, when you're pushing boundaries, this step alone is its own project. Um, so won't spend too much time. And then lastly, you have to find a way to now hermetically encapsulate the electronics from the environment. And this is, this is what's tricky with this design. Because remember, the other end of this thin film is the electrode array um, that's implanted into tissue. And fluid will travel up the cables and get to this interface that I've pointed to in red. Um, so without spending more time on this, so I'll just leave it as this is a failure point for really long-term implants. And then the last point I have to make here on this kind of design is um, just the image on the bottom right. So that another challenge with the flip chip bonding as you go to higher channel counts and densities is planarity. It, any warping of either of your pieces um, will cause a situation where you can't get 100% yield. Here's another view of that. So you may be able to get so a perfect connection in many of the areas, but if you push too much in one area, you get shorts and then it lifts up on the other corner and then you get opens. So it becomes really difficult to get high yield with this process as you get to these higher densities, uh, smaller features, bigger pieces. Um, in R&D, this isn't that big of a deal if your yield isn't perfect. But if you're trying to commercialize a product, uh, this can be a deal breaker. So you might think, hey, chips are built on wafers. Why don't we just build the thin film arrays directly on the chip? This gets rid of this entire bond process that I just went through uh, painstakingly and it's, and it's a more streamlined manufacturing process. This is actually a great idea, but as of uh, right now, there are some barriers to doing this like cost of manufacturing and material process um, incompatibilities between polymers and what's traditionally done with silicon. So I do think it's just a matter of time before we overcome these barriers, but in the meantime, we need another solution. One thing we can do is to um, modify more conventional packaging models that currently exist. Uh, so it's important to remember that we're making such a big deal about hermetically isolating the electronics because failure here is a risk to the patient. And this is a really important part of any neural implant des de design. So here's a, a little bit easier model for us to look at. So the, the key design here is now you don't have a direct connection from the array, which is interfacing with the outside world, to the active electronics. Instead, there is a barrier between the two. In this case, it's the feed-through substrate. And the key elements in this model are that you have a hermetic package, which consists of the can, hermetic can here, the lid, 
the substrate to which the lid is hermetically sealed. You have your thin film electrode array. You have some kind of bond and insulation between the array and the substrate. And then you have the electronics that are safely housed inside the can. This model has been used in other applications with high channel count, high density arrays that I've worked on. And uh, just again, another reminder that what we're doing is we're taking advantage of this flip chip bonding method, having the highest efficiency in terms of bonding area so that we can work with higher ch channel count devices without having gigantic packages. The problem here is this is not yet a standard option. It still falls in the realm of R&D and still needs a lot of work to be before becoming wildly accessible. Uh, so as you can see, there are a lot of components to this system. And so I'm just gonna, each of these is like, again, uh, a whole challenge in itself um, as you're pushing the limits, but I'm just gonna walk through one of these features, which is um, one of these components, the feed through substrate. So pretend you're in the packaging team at a super exciting BCI company. And from the team, you were chosen to be in charge of developing the feed through substrate. Let's walk through what that experience might be like. First, you determine your design requirements like pitch and substrate size. Then because you're new to this field, you do a lot of research on what's already out there, starting with conventional off the shelf options and eventually looking into what's happening in R&D because it turns out none of the off the shelf options uh, meet your design requirements. Your company is just too, too cutting edge. So you do find some vendors working in the R&D space to work with, but you also have your own internal team to start working on their own ideas for the next generation devices that no vendors can do. Okay, back to the substrate. So first uh, you decide on the substrate material. You keep in mind that it has to be an insulator, has to be made of bio, and it has to be made of biocompatible materials, has to be thick enough to be strong, but not so thick that the via aspect ratios become too difficult for the later steps. The material also needs to be compatible with the next few steps in terms of processing temperature that it can withstand and mechanical robustness. So I'm showing, I'm showing these in subsequent steps, but in reality, you would do this, you would design all these steps at once because they're all very inter interdependent choices. Okay, but next in the process is how do you get holes in your substrate? It sounds like uh, each of these steps alone sounds like no big deal, but you know, with everything, there's actually a lot of engineering and science that goes into it. So remember, this is a high channel count device. So you need a lot of holes that are densely packed but these holes are being made in a brittle substrate. You know, common material is ceramic. So the more holes you make, the more fragile your substrate becomes. And that's why you want it to be thick. But the thicker you make it, the harder it is to drill these small holes that you need all the way through because of the aspect ratio. But you come up with some options. Now you need to fill the holes with a conductor. Importantly, they need to be filled such that the substrate is hermetic. No gaps, no voids, no cracks. And all the materials you're choosing have to be non-toxic. So you can't just use copper, which is a commonly, um, a commonly used uh, fill for this, I mean, without like a lot of extra work that you'd have to do, uh, which so I'll dive into this step a little bit deeper in a couple of slides, but let's just move on to the last step for now. You get, you get your uh, conductor filled in hermetic fashion. Lastly, you figure out a compatible way to print the what are called seal pads and routing layers on top of the vias. And then you send your device out for hermeticity, hermeticity testing, which by the way, is, is at this, these kinds of devices, it's not straightforward. You might need to investigate a couple of different um, types of testing to be confident in your results. But after a few iterations, you eventually get a substrate that passes and you've completed your task. So to, to me, the whole process is really like, um, like a puzzle. You're constantly balancing a lot of material science, engineering, and manufacturing parameters. Uh, I think it can be pretty fun. You get to work on fundamental material science problems, but in a very applied and practical way. And if, so if you like puzzles, I think you should try designing a neural implant package. And I just was talking about one piece of that whole package. 
But let's uh, remind just for a second, um, back to when you were trying to figure out what fill to use. So you decide um, electroplating is the way. It's a controllable process. It doesn't require harsh sintering temperatures. The conditions are actually mild. And if designed right, you can electroplate at a whole wafer level. But after quite a bit of effort, you find that the plating kinetics for gold and platinum, which are your target materials, are so slow it would take over a week per wafer to properly plate your vias. In addition, it's proving difficult to get uniform plating as shown in these images of real samples. You see, uh, we have overflow in some of the vias while other vias don't fill properly. And there are many other issues that are um, not even shown here, but in short, you're under pressure for time and decide that this option would require significant R&D and that you don't have time for that. So you try a more conventional method, a screen printing process. So here's a cross section of an actual substrate where conductive paste fill was used. Uh, in this process, the fill is done by screen printing. So you, you have this paste that you essentially squeegee into the holes until it fills up and these via holes that you had created earlier. This has to be done iterative, iteratively. You have to partially fill the hole with um, your paste and then stop, center it at very high temperatures. It can be as high as 1000 C depending on your materials. Um, you're doing this uh, iterative process because you're trying to degas and burn off and uh, binding agents that are in the paste. And remember, you don't want any voids in your via because um, it needs to be hermetic. But you get the process worked out and uh, you get a cross-section image and find out that the fill looks great. This is, um, as I said, this is an actual image can, that is from a real sample. Uh, the, it's great, the process is harsher than plating, but in the same am amount of development time, your vias already look much nicer. But then you look at the substrate from another view and you find cracks around the vias and hermeticity testing confirms your fear. Liquids are able to get through the cracks. You suspect that this comes from the CTE or coefficient of thermal expansion mismatch between your conductor and your substrate because with this process, there is a lot of thermal cycling happening at very high temperatures. And if you look at this table on the right, um, this is why for medical device implants, the conventional materials for feed through uh, substrates are ceramic and platinum. So, because look at how well they're matched, it's like eight and nine. Unfortunately, due to some of the issues I've discussed earlier around via holes and mechanical robustness, the combination of materials, or this particular combination of materials, um, is currently limited to larger sizes and lower densities than what we need. So strike two on the VFL. Um, you decide both the paste and plating options might work eventually, but with the paste, you've already pushed it to its limits. Even if you got it to work, this method would become obsolete with your next device design in terms of how tight you can make the pitch the via pitches. Electroplating still has room to get to higher densities, but just getting to a feasibility step is going to take a lot of time and effort. Luckily, you work with a team of hardworking geniuses and they come up with a third option. They've developed a process to monolithically build the thin film array directly onto a microfabricated feed-through substrate. The benefits here are, it can be done in-house in your facility, you're not having to rely on vendors, there's still room for uh, tighter densities for future device generations and preliminary testing showed it's hermetic. So you decide to go with this option, which unfortunately I can't tell you the details of because it's proprietary. But your team succeeds and their tasks just meet the deadline, um, though there's still a lot of work left for optimization um, on, this, on this process because it's brand new. But here are images of actual parts that were made in this way. So to reiterate, the feed-through substrate itself is microfabricated at a wafer level, which allowed us to then build the electrodes or uh, electrode rays on top, eliminating the need, the need for any additional bonding and insulation step. And here's another view with the can uh, lid hermetically sealed onto the substrate. So as great as that was, um, my final message here is actually 
this specific way of monolithically building a substrate is not the right answer for many applications. You have to have a very special case to use this, your own clean room and really tight densities that you need. The other options I described and new commercial um, available options like what I'm showing on the right that are coming out or have just come out are useful actually in most cases. So now I'm speaking as a consultant for stop startups. Um, a lot of my clients are in need of these packaging solutions that I've talked about. Uh, for many of these needs, these substrate uh, densities that are available, still R&D, but are available work fine. Where we're stuck is this next step, because now we've just pushed a problem to this next step of bonding the array to the substrate and insulating the bonds. Now, I've essentially already explained all of these um, challenges earlier, so I won't go through them again. But my ask is for, um, to, for help in finding a solution to this problem. So a shameless plug for my own needs, but really I'm speaking to the needs of an industry trying to bring high channel count electrode arrays into humans. And I see uh, the topics that I've discussed today as some of the biggest challenge, uh, challenges or barriers in that effort. And throughout this talk, I've uh, been hopefully like trying to show a perspective of the non-technical barriers uh, that you don't, you may not think about while you're in school or working on um, your PhD project. Though some, a lot of projects now are a lot more translational. But uh, this is just another slide to drive home the point that oftentimes science isn't the barrier, the technology does exist. It's these more practical issues that prevent a device from um, becoming a product. So my last words on packaging. It's an exciting area, please join. It's an important component Failure puts the patient's life at risk. And there are a lot of ways you can impact the field by working on these problems. This is my obligatory summary slide here. And big thank you to my former teammates at Livermore and Neuralink. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. You can all unmute now if you want to hear the applause. Otherwise, it'll <laughs> you'll just see that with signs, it's always eerily quiet. Thank, Thank you. you. Shall I unshare or just keep keep this? Oh, you can. Now? Yeah, you can leave that up if you want, in okay. case you need to go back in. Okay. Yeah, the problem with group applause like this is everybody picture everyone's picture starts splashing up when they start clapping really loud. Unless you pin the uh, unless you pin the speaker on the screen. So great, thanks for that uh, wonderful seminar. Are there any questions? Um, you could either run them through chat or feel free to kind of unmute and ask. I've got two questions. Away. Go ahead. Um, so correct me if they sound off the side of the, you know, outside the realm that you're able to do. Is there a way that you could carve a hermetic spillway that will allow liquids to enter and exit the chip without disturbing any of the other components or fill the sealed area with a substance that will naturally be a barrier to any penetration? So something that has the same density and, and the same chemical makeup as whatever fluid that the body has around the chip that you want to implant. So if it's brain area, something that's similar to uh, brain spinal fluid. The first part, so you're kind of describing like a moat, a uh, like a lower resistance path to encourage the any liquid infiltration. Is that what you mean? Yeah. So if it yeah. does infiltrate, it's spat right back out. So something like a Tesla right. valve or something that will yeah. just bypass it right through the trip, right through yeah. the chip, but it won't hit any critical components. Right. Um, I, I have, we, I have like, we played with some designs that kind of with that idea, but I don't think in a uh, fashion that was um, like really uh, successful. So not to say that, I think it's a possibility. There's a design that someone can make the, um, what I wouldn't understand those, if there's like a flood of liquid at some point, it's just gonna get saturated and it can't, I guess you said a valve. So I don't know if there's active pumping that you would need to, to keep that gradient, to keep 
pulling out. I will add that small capillary action would just make it flow in and out on its own. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. There, yeah, there could could be a design um, as long as it, you're not trading off like size and. Right. The that's second great. question, I'm not sure I understand. So, um, something like a ferrofluid suspension, some people will um, for shocks suspension. Mm -hmm. Hmm. But in applicable for the indus this industry, you would use like a saline solution that's hmm. non-destructive to the chip, but it would still yeah. be hmm. have the same properties of the surrounding fluid to yeah. prevent it. That way you've already sealed right. the chip with something that has the same density and uh, properties. Yeah. So no infiltration can occur because it, it, the pressure and is hmm. already balanced. Yeah, I guess the trick is uh, what is that fluid? Right. It was safe for, for the chip, but also kind of like the CSF. The idea makes sense. I just wouldn't know what that fluid would be. Yeah. Those are my two cents. Great presentation. Thank you. Thanks. I'm glad I got people thinking about the packaging problems. Yeah. <laughs> that was my goal. <laughs> are there other questions? Yeah, I have one. Um... Uh, so I work, I've worked with the Utah array in the lab and, uh, one of the issues that is very common for it is the, uh, leads breaking, um, upon implantation. Um, and I was curious with the high channels and the really small traces you guys are using, did you guys see any of that, uh, in either of your work with this? Um, just cause I know it's, it's one of the problems that we've had to address. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen, um, I mean, I can't talk about the specifics of which and where, but I definitely, in the time I've spent working on this at both companies, um, there was one uh, where we realized that as we got below a certain thickness with our polyimid devices, um, the micro cracks is what we we're calling it, must have been happening. Like it was hard to visually see them, but the way I knew it is my impedance kept changing uh, just with the device moving in water. So, and it was related to the thickness of the probe. So it, at some point we ended up putting it into our design role. Uh, this is actually at Livermore. I think that that's fine to say uh, that we had to, given our, that kind of design, we had to keep um, the insulation thickness a certain amount to prevent that from happening. So yeah, you, that can definitely happen and then as I mentioned, the longer your device, you know, if you're going from rat to deep brain targets in humans, you're just asking for more failure points for more cracks to happen. And then also matters um, what is, uh, what are the, the manical, mechanical stresses that you expect your device to see. So for polymer probes, there's that part where it comes out. It's, so it's different from, from silicon probes where it's stiff all the way. For polymer probes, you have to worry about that part that comes out and is flexible and uh, when the brain is moving, but it's tethered to the skull. So these are areas that you have to uh, pay attention to. Got it, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for presenting. It was uh, very great to see some of this uh, material. Thank you. Um, I also have a, a question as well. So um, is invasive implantation the only way to put these chips inside the human body? I mean, if you're, there's, there are, are you probably aware of people, the, there's a minimally invasive version, which is going through um, endovascular uh, path. So like through stents, same way stents are made. So that's one way that's out there. And I think people have different, uh, on the research side, people have talked about injecting small particles, uh, but I think none, I haven't seen any of those make it beyond really academic settings. But yeah, yeah there's ideas out there. Probably the furthest ones out are the, the stent-like devices, if we're talking not fully invasive. Or, or were you referring to uh, non-invasive approaches for interfacing? Yeah, that is what I was referring to, is non-invasive non options possible? It depends on what you're trying to accomplish, really. 
I mean, when you look at there's been a group in Stanford, it's been doing extensive work. There were competitions out there and the implantable devices beat the non-implantable ones in terms of uh, information content, number of uh, bits that can be processed per unit time by leagues. They're not even in the same ballpark. So it depends really what you need to do. There's certain things you can do with toys you can already buy, like an EMG, uh, sorry, EEG headband. Mm -hmm. And there are other things that are, you know, it's like taking a magnifying class when you need an electron microscope. It's pretty simple. And so mm -hmm. you've got to go inside to get there because you don't have this, the localization. Mm -hmm. but, um, um, there is that new DARPA award, N3, forgot what it stands for, yeah, but yeah, yeah. non-invasive, but, but yeah, I think at some point, the kind of data you're getting, you can't compare to invasive, but, but it might not matter again for your applications, mm -hmm. that's what it comes down to. Uh, I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, as a person who's... Uh, first, actually, that was very interesting. Thank you for that fantastic presentation. Um, I like thinking about packaging, and I didn't know I would. <laughs> um, Great. So you're going through career transitions and trying to figure out where you're going. Uh, for recent grads or people looking into jumping into industry, what are top 10 ti uh, tips like what should we be doing to make this transition recent grads who specifically know they want to go into industry yeah there are um two categories i mean you have to think about what kind well just why you want to go into industry because there's start the startup environment i think is very different from a large company i haven't been to a large corporation but i imagine they're very different or from what i've heard so that that's one thing. Um, so I, I get to know what the differences are. And um, the other thing is like networking. That's what everyone's going to say about job searching. It's important to uh, put yourself out there. Even before you graduate, there's a lot of, if you want to stay in neuro also, like there are now these clubs and groups that you can be a part of. And a lot of startup people are joining those, uh, like they're giving talks, they're being parts of panels, um, ask questions in those, you know, pay attention, ask questions, uh, get your name out there when you're going, well, once conferences are a thing again, you know, try to get the courage to talk to, to people and target your, um, the people you want to go to. So networking is a big one, but I think, um, in terms of industry, like the there's different aspects of it too. Like what what I've been talking to students who are looking for for jobs. What I've been asked before is like, hey, this is what I'm doing in my PhD. It doesn't perfectly match what this industry do, is doing. Can I still apply? The answer is yes. What you want to get across when you're interviewing is your ability to problem solve, not that if you have a good hiring manager, they're not going to hire you because you worked on something specific, which does happen a lot. Like, oh, you, and, and might be useful, but you, if that's all they're hiring you for is this experience you've had, then you're going to eventually work on problems you've never worked on before. So you, that's, that's going to be like useless information pretty quickly once you start. So practice um, how you explain your experience in terms of working on challenging problems. So rather than just repeating maybe a paper or, or there's like a process, what, practice with your friends and, and, and advisors how you uh, thought through a problem. Uh, it's not even, sorry for the long answer, but the, this is a big thing we were doing at Neuralink. Like we were really trained on, <laughs> on interviewing. And um, some when I, when I ask this question to, candidates, like what's the most challenging problem you worked on? Tell me about it, three levels deep. They, they first response are for, is that they wanna talk about the biggest device, most impactful device. What I, I don't care if it's a tiny little step, like it was just one step where I had to figure out this temperature and it took me six months. That little tiny insignificant thing, but it turned out to be really challenging. That was what we were looking for, like if you can drive that, because that tells me how you're thinking. I don't care if in the end it was made for something 
like not really that interesting, something in your garage, but if the, the technical questions you were asking yourself were really challenging, then that's more important to get across. But that takes practice to be able to talk about that. Thank you for that long answer. I hope that helps some other grad students on, on this. Thank you. So any, any more questions from the audience? Um, I have one more. Okay. Um, I'm just wondering, um, do you have to recall any particular experience that really drew you into this field? Um, it was, <laughs> I was applying for grads. It's not, a, it's not a very interesting story, but I was applying for grad school at the time. And I thought it was okay. I applied to like nine chemical engineering PhD programs. And, and then I decided on a whim to do one PhD program for um, pharmacology. And I got an interview at UCSF. And during my visit, I got, I was introduced to people working on neuroscience, like researchers. And I'm really embarrassed to admit this to, but I admit it to everyone. I didn't know about neuroscience until that point. Like that maybe they didn't really teach it. I don't know, I'm from Florida, no offense, but like they didn't, we didn't learn really explicitly neuroscience um, in school. So that just blew my mind. And I like, but at that point I had already applied to a bunch of chemical engineering schools. So once I decided to go to UCLA, when I was looking for a project, um, I started looking up neuroscientists and if, if I could make any kind of uh, extraction to engineering to neuroscience, how do I get in there with an engineering background? And then that's how I ended up on a project for biosensors for the brain. But it was just uh, fascinating. What fascinated me about neuroscience, I've always been interested in psychology and behavior, but I, but I like the hard sciences and neuroscience is that middle ground. But I think engineering is even better because then I have control of everything and can make stuff for the neuroscientists. Um, but yeah, that's how I got into it. I happened to visit a university and saw some researchers work on rats. Yeah, actually, I, I, I have, see. Sorry? I said sorry. I see, yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry, no, no, the, the, primarily the audience and students should ask. I can always <laughs> contact Vanessa later. Um, also want to be cognizant of the time slot. Uh, Steve, officially, when does this end? Um, about 10 minutes ago. OK, well, well done. <laughs> <laughs> but for the, the graduate seminar students, they are pretty much free to drop off when the seminar is over, when they need to go. But you know, really, if people want to hang out and ask some questions, it really is. Um, you know, we, we can do that for a little while. Yeah, I mean, it's clearly a sign that uh, most everybody, I see people are starting to drop off now because we're getting to the next classes or whatever is happening afterwards. But uh, it's a sign of how, you know, how interested people were that uh, they, they stayed behind. And I just wanted before everybody else drops off one more time in, in public, say thank you very much for doing that. I really love the talk. It was one of the, the best ones that I've I've seen in quite a while here because you also very nicely coupled the different aspects of your own experience, career components, um, the, uh, you know, the system level engineering, big picture, but then also diving into some of the technical problems. This is really something we're trying to implement and embed more and more both into our undergraduate and into our graduate program because it's a huge competitive advantage for an yeah. engineer if you understand these aspects. They're just so right. important, um, you know, and I've seen so many cases where somebody is actually the brighter engineer, but if you can't communicate it, if you are not able to, you know, put it into context and understand what is the minimum viable product. You know, sometimes mm -hmm. you need to understand what the company needs or what the customer needs. And, you know, then striking that uh, that balance because we're never done. I'm never done. There's always something more you can do and yep. fiddle and it's not quite right. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's wonderful to, and quite inspiring to see you, you do that and convey that. Oh, thanks so much for the feedback. It's really useful. I always wonder, you know, <laughs> if it's the right level. So thank you for the feedback. Wonderful. All right. Well, then, um, 
you know, we can keep that open a little bit longer. I don't know where, where your time uh, limit is. I'm, I think I've got about two or three minutes <laughs> left for my next call to come up here. Uh, I was going to follow up with you one more time. You had the short Hermes uh, glass there. There's also <laughs> the, the Sermat, and we, we may need to have a discussion about that pretty shortly because um, I've got some experience there as well and was interested okay. in, your, in your take. So, but I'll, I'll, I'll ping you separately on that. Great. Sounds good. All right, Vanessa, thank you very much from my side. Steve, I don't know if you want to sail it into the sunset and then decide when or and Vanessa, by the way, don't feel obliged. I really know, you know, despite the fact that you're in transition now, you still have a pretty busy schedule as well. And so you shouldn't feel feel obliged. That's and sure. we'll follow up at one point. We'll uh, we'll get you here and depending